Hey, Buck Dwell here with Follow Through Consulting. I'm the founder and CEO for Follow Through Consulting. We're a tactical training company, but we also dive into other things with the military, law enforcement, and we also do some stuff with Hollywood as well. For a little bit on my background, I'm about 21 and a half years in the Marine Corps. I spent most of my time in the Force Reconnaissance field. After I retired from the Marine Corps, I immediately went into advising and assisting for the Department of Defense. Um, that put me almost eight months out of the year overseas in Afghanistan and Europe, working with conventional and soft units, helping them out in challenging spots when they were deployed, kind of like being a coach on the field. That job really opened my eyes to a lot of different things. In the Marine Corps or any organization here, you know, your SEAL, Green Beret, whatnot, when you grow up and live and work in those environments, we all live in a little bit of a fishbowl. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but at the same time, it's one's perspective. When I was an advisor for Department of Defense, I got to jump in everyone's fishbowl. So Rangers, SEALs, Green Berets, Marines, your 82nd Airborne, so on and so forth. And when I dove into their fishbowls, I would go and participate in their operations downrange or in Afghanistan. And what I found was that everyone had the same mission. Everyone's skill sets were about the same, give or take depending on gear and uh, training opportunities. Perspective was always a little different. Outcomes obviously were similar, but the common thread that I found when I jumped into these different fishbowls was at some point there was fatigue or a lack of understanding in the fundamentals of gunfighting. And so um, during those four years, I gradually progressed in, in writing down a lot of notes or establishing a diary on some of those common threads. And from there came my three gunfighting tenants, shoot, move, and communicate. It's a phrase or term I grew up with in the Marine Corps and reconnaissance field. I kind of adopted that phrase and I extracted these common threads from my diaries and gave those three tenants some meat, some things to look at and to ensure they don't compromise. For instance, under shoot, the fundamentals of marksmanship for what they are. And what I found is the fundamentals of marksmanship a lot of times are dictated off of a piece of gear or a certain technique. So weapons set up, a lot of times, individuals will look at a weapon set up and say, hey, we need this, 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 and on there based off of gear or, or, or type of gear, rather than looking at the capability. What capability do you want out of your weapon setup? And if you peel back and scrutinize the capability, your weapon setup, setup will appear. And in ballistics, you don't have to be a ballistician, but understanding what kind of performance you want out of your bullet. Not in flight, but also when it hits the target. What do you want out of that? And be able to take the limitations on either end and work with it and train to it. Know what you can and can't do to it. Then don't go off it just because it has a bad BC or whatever. And then there's optics. Again, capability. What capability do you want to have? That? And then look at your contingencies. Look at your environment. There probably isn't one fit all optic, but you have to look at your environment and look at the left and right of that spectrum you're gonna be dealing with and make sure that that optics gonna be at best adequate in everything. But in this day and age, there's a lot of ways you can go optimal on your optics by having different optics on your weapon. And you really have to peel back that onion on that. And that's shoot. Then we move on to move. People think, okay, you're gonna talk about running and all that stuff. Not necessarily. Moving is just that. How are you gonna move in a gunfighting environment? Heart rate. Anytime you put any kind of gear on and whatnot, you're gonna induce heart rate. And so with induced heart rate, you gotta know how you're gonna perform with that heart rate. And if you're not spending 80% of your time shooting at that heart rate, then you're really not gonna know how you're gonna perform. And that goes from your weapon setup maybe being eight pounds. Okay, cool, if you're just doing up drills in, in a perfect environment, then yeah, you can handle it. But if you're on day two and your heart rate bumps up, and you're fatigued a little bit, that eight pounds can feel like 30. Sympathetic movement kicks in, you know, the refined movement you have in your fingers in a perfect environment, maybe one, but then when you're fatigued, what is that like? You don't have to go out there and, and blow 180, you know, and shoot all the time, but just bumping it up and seeing where you're at and the different engagements you may uh, have to be confronted with when shooting. Understanding that, not saying you have to be a master at it, but if you know your limitations, then other things will come into play. How are you gonna move to your position of cover? Are you gonna run like a bat out of hell, or are you gonna have a sustained movement? And knowing all those different things are very important. Footwork is very important. If you're training in an environment where your landscape is groomed and there's no obstacles, then you're, and you do that over and over again, you're gonna be conditioned to just move a certain way. But the minute you come out in an environment like this, we're out here in Teesdale, Utah, where you have Mother Nature dictating 
how the earth or the floor is going to be laid out, you have to take a conscious effort to look down the ground and understand how you're going to move. Foot placement, raising your feet, all that good stuff. Your knees, I mean, where are you going to put your knees? They've got cactus out here. So you just can't move, you know, seamlessly out here without being, a, being aware of your surroundings or the ground or what it's going to do. I prefer being in a raw environment because it's making you use all your senses. It's making you use your eyes, your hearing, you're looking down, you're feeling things out with your hands. You're gonna find that you're gonna to have to use your firing hand, your non-firing hand, your rifle to negotiate terrain to get in a good position. So this environment brings reality to how you're gonna move around in a gunfight where square range may not give you all those training aids or prompts to activate your senses of your situation awareness using your peripheral of things so on and so forth i'm not saying one's better than the other just one lends itself to a different perspective of training when you talk about uh, movement and gunfight and whatnot uh, you need to ensure that when you're moving you're taking your environment in consideration it'd be no different from a running back doing running drills to being tossed the ball and just doing his different plays in an open field with no one hitting him or not going through his offensive line. And then all of a sudden he does that for, you know, six, eight weeks. And then his first game, you throw him in there with pads and all of a sudden he's getting hit by defenders. His whole game is going to change because now he's not worried about running the plays. He's worrying about how do I deal with getting hit or how do I anticipate the hit? How do I avoid the hit? You know, all those different things. So. When you look at your training environment, you look at your movement, you really have to look at that aspect of it. You know, my environment, what environment am I gonna be in? Am I making sure that I have those same training aids in there? And some of your basic training aids you wanna look at, it's just how do I avoid obstacles? How I identify points of cover or concealment? Those need to be in there. My search and assess. I may have the shot, but I can't take it because of certain object on or around my target. Those are all things that you have to consider and being out here in Teesdale, Utah in this raw environment, I can do that. There's no what ifs. It's like if a, a shooter asks about shooting through bushes, I can see the target, but I know my bullet's gonna hit. Well, how many shots you gotta shoot to get through those tree limbs and hit your target? Cause that is your shot. It's not, oh wait, we're gonna move over here and then shoot. It's just, you have to look at your environment for what it is and say, okay, I know if I shoot four or five times through these tree limbs, I'll eventually hit my target. That's good information for a shooter to know, especially if he's going down range and getting a gunfight. And that's what a raw environment allows you to do. There's nothing wrong with square range. It's just that recognizing what do you want to do there on that square range, because a lot of repetition get done. There's a lot of movement. There's a lot of things you can do there, but there's there certain aspects that you're not going to get there um, and saying just pretend or act like it's not going to work, especially when you have folks going down range to put their lives and the lives of their battle buddies online. You want to make sure that developing those senses, they're understanding what right looks like in certain environments. Under communicate, I basically have situational awareness and mindset under that tenant. Situational awareness, we talk about it all the time. It's just that, having that situational awareness that you understand your environment, you understand how you can move in it. A saying, I heard this a long time ago, growing up in the Marine Corps, if you as an individual as a team have sound situational awareness, you'll probably never get in a gunfight. And then if you do, your likelihood of you surviving it are very high. Situational awareness is just knowing your surroundings, knowing, anticipating certain things that pop up, knowing how to move, looking at your feedback. I use feedback as the, one of the biggest takeaways in my class is understanding what feedback looks like when you're shooting at a target. Whether you hit the target or you miss a target, to me it's a win because if you see your hits and your misses, you're reading your feedback. That tells me that you have a strong shooting position. You know, if you see your feedback, you have a good shooting position. You're looking through your optic correctly. All those fundamentals of marksmanship are being executed correctly. Reading feedback is, is very key in situational awareness. It also will tell you your real method of engagement. But how many shots you're going to need to take on a target is going to depend on what you see as being your desired effects on target. So if I'm shooting a piece of steel and I want five hits and it takes me 15 shots, I'm good to go. But I know it took me 15 shots because I missed on 10 of them. But if I can see the misses, that's still a win. That's still good information because you're seeing and you're maintaining a good body position and all that good stuff. Understanding what feedback looks like on different targets. So if you're shooting still, you get a splash and you get audible. But if you're shooting a rubber dummy at 300 meters, 
what does that look like? That can be a challenge to establish, but it can be done. If you put clothing on it, uh, what does it look like when the round hits the front of the target? Turn it sideways, are you getting an exit, exit wound from that rubber dummy? And there's uh, the misses on cement, on dirt, on rocks. What does that feedback look like? Oh, and by the way, if there's wind in your environment and you miss left and right, say you hit the ground, the ground below the target and there's dirt, you're gonna get a wind indicator. If there's wind blowing left, right, how strong the wind's blowing? That's information for that, that environmental consideration at the target. There's so many different things about situation awareness that you can go into, but you gotta have the right training venue. Range estimation. There's a lot of ways you can, you can establish range estimation. There's range finders, there's milling things out, measuring stuff, so on and so forth. But in certain environments, or certain situations, time may not permit you to do all that. So if you're accustomed to shooting 200, 300, 500, all those different ranges in raw environments, you're gonna establish that keen sense of looking at distance and being able to establish how far that is. And if you are well versed on your optic and your bullet you're shooting, you'll be able to know what to hold and how to get around on or near target first, second round shot. Again, that takes practice, but to use an analogy, John Elway in his prime, he didn't have a range finder when he was sewing to his receivers, especially when he was going leaving the pocket. He would leave the pocket, identify a receiver he wanted to throw to, and he would just release it. What he did it was he just threw that ball in that scenario over and over and over again until he established what right looked like, not only visually, but physically. It's practice, you can do it. I'll, do, I'll give credit what credit's due. My long range instructor, Todd Hodnick, is the one who taught me that because he would go out there and shoot any course of fire anywhere on his property and shoot it and hit the target when the first round hits. And we're talking, how do you do that? And where, why didn't you range it? How did you mill that out so fast? It's like, I shoot this every day, guys. And if you shoot it every day, if you look at it every day, it becomes familiar. It'd be no different from you throwing a, a piece of paper in your trash can in your office. It becomes your shot. Technical gear is very important. It helps that out a lot, but there's gonna be times where you're not gonna be able to use it or it may not be appropriate in a certain in a situation. So establishing so your senses and able to establish that situation awareness when it comes to range, feedback, environmentals is very key. And you have to be in an environment that allows you to do that winter, fall, summer, spring. These are the fundamentals and principles I feel that need to be mastered in order to be successful and to come back home to your loved ones and bring your boys back home from a gunfight.